So today we're going to be talking about DBT and how to use DBT as an approach for working with veterans who have borderline personality disorder who have received disruptive behavior flags. So first I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that flag system is that the VA has. We're going to talk a little bit about what issues could come up when you label a patient with BPD's chart as having disruptive behavior. But then we're also going to save a lot of time towards the end of the workshop to show you some videos, um, some you know videos we acted out, so we can have some discussion about uh, skills and, and techniques you might be able to use in different situations. So for those that aren't familiar, the Veterans Health Administration, or the VA, is the largest integrated public health system in the U.S., and it utilizes a really extensive connected electronic medical record database. There's over 6 million veterans enrolled in the healthcare system across um, almost 1,300 facilities. Now, as part of the efforts to improve identification of patients who may be at a higher risk of either hurting themselves or hurting others, um, the VHA developed a patient record flag system. Uh, so there's different flags that can be issued and assigned to a patient's chart. One flag indicates the patient is at acute high risk for suicide. Another flag indicates that the patient is at acute high risk for disruptive behavior. When those flags are then assigned to someone's chart, they're viewable by all VA providers and staff when they then open that patient's electronic medical record. So the flag system is meant to be a systems level safety program focused on prevention uh, instead of punishment. And it was designed to help improve provider safety when you're providing care for patients at higher risk of violence. The flag system uh, hasn't had a lot of research, but it has been found to be heavily used often with guidance to provide police protection for providers. And providers in general have indicated satisfaction with the system. So between the two um, categories of flags, there are a lot of differences. With a suicide risk flag, they are administered by a suicide prevention coordinator and they're evaluated every 90 days. They're reviewed every 90 days um, to see if the chart should be added, um, the flag should be added or removed. Disruptive behavior flags are administered by um, the disruptive behavior board and the person who coordinates that. And they aren't reviewed, um, they're only reviewed every two years. And um, at that point, at the two years, they'd evaluate to see if the chart can be, if the flag could be removed or not. One of the things we'll talk about that we think um, could be one of the biggest you know, issues or discrepancies between them is when you get a suicide risk flag, it really indicates greater access to care. The suicide prevention coordinators are trained in multiple interventions to help uh, with suicide prevention. They're going to you know, check in multiple times. There's going to be multiple evaluations, sometimes weekly, um, especially after release from inpatient mental health. And there's just a lot of access to care that comes with those flags. Whereas the disruptive behavior flag can indicate a decrease in access to care. When you receive one, it can limit where you're able to receive care. You might not be able to go to a CBOC anymore, which is a community clinic. You might have to go to a main hospital. You might have to check in with police first. You might not be able to work with certain providers. So it can be a decrease in care and the disruptive behavior coordinators do not have training in providing intervention uh, for this group. So there's no sort of coaching on how to reduce these um, problematic behaviors. There's not um, discussion around working on anger or managing behavior. It's just sort of risk assessment and then the charts, uh, flags put on the chart. So there has not been a lot of research in this area. However, when there has been a few studies that did chart reviews for patients who have received disruptive behavior flags, personality disorders, has been in the top two or three of the diagnoses, most common, common diagnoses um, for multiple chart reviews. Even for chart reviews where 
um, even in one chart review, when personality disorders wasn't listed, many of the people still had indicators in their notes that the provider thought they might have a personality disorder. So frequent mentions of cluster B personality traits, personality disorder NOS, or other code words that clinicians sometimes use to indicate they think someone might have a BPD diagnosis. We've seen that looking at um, a group that's already at high risk for receipt of both of these flags, individuals with SMI diagnoses like schizophrenia and bipolar, when there's a comorbid personality disorder diagnosis present, the likelihood of receiving a behavioral flag um, increases greatly. So we're seeing that um, there's discrepancies between these flags and that individuals with personality disorders are receiving them uh, more often than many other diagnoses. So I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, um, Hilary DeShong, to talk a little bit about what that might mean for our population. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. Um, yeah, so I'm going to just kind of highlight several studies and the research related to why it's important for us to even think about this related to individuals with BPD and some of the studies highlighting the stigma. Um, so this First, I just want to kind of touch on the research, and a lot of this is actually pretty recent stuff coming out um, in the sense that there's not really a good way that we actually assign flags. And uh, as Sharon kind of highlighted, there's not a lot of training uh, for clinicians and health practitioners on how to discuss this therapeutically with their patients. And related to that is the stigma, which I know has been uh, come up several times throughout the conference today, because uh, this can lead to unintended different approaches that providers might give, um, including who receives a flag and when. And so just to highlight two recent studies, uh, Klein and colleagues actually did a review of the literature looking at structural stigma, so stigma regarding like the healthcare system and the impact that it has on individuals with BPD. Um, and really what they found is that there is this level of stigma regarding individuals with BPD such that uh, when they are in a crisis and they do present for services, um, that this is likely to happen a lot more for them compared to people with other diagnoses. And then also McKenzie and colleagues uh, did a review on just attitudes of mental health care workers uh, related to different diagnoses and found that people who are labeled as having BPD uh, they, they have a more negative attitude about and those individuals compared to other diagnoses like depression and even PTSD. Uh, go next, Sharon, thank you. Um, so yeah, just to highlight some additional research um, is that um, some of that was very recent, but even as far back as 2013, um, we, we are seeing a lot of uh, articles coming out related to what is the experience of people with BPD. Um, and in this one actually got to uh, be like a more qualitative approach and asking people what their experiences were. So just to highlight that, um, we've been aware about this for a while. Uh, we can come on, Sharon. Um, so what, how does this relate back to the flags, um, particularly behavioral flags, um, is that there's a lot of research coming out related to BPD and also other uh, groups of individuals um, who are underrepresented. Uh, so some research coming out with sexual minority adults in that individuals with, uh, who identify as a sexual minority are actually uh, more likely to uh, get a BPD diagnosis. Uh, and this is regardless of their actual symptom presentation. Um, so not only that, but often when you have men with BPD, they are actually seen typically and rated to be more dangerous and evoke more fear compared to women with BPD. And in the VA, obviously we're working with a lot of uh, men or male presenting individuals. And so this is something we wanna be very aware of that we may be more inclined to very quickly assign that behavioral flag because it evokes fear in uh, practitioners. Uh, so just kind of give it all that flags are likely to give, uh, be given at disproportionate rates for individuals with BPD and they're less likely or are likely or differences depending on things like race, sex, and gender. So what are those possible impacts? 
Um, it's obviously there's stigma associated with the diagnosis, and as Sharon pointed out, also stigma associated with getting that flag. Um, so it's kind of this compounding effect. Uh, it also compromises privacy and can restrict their care, as Sharon went over. Um, and and patients don't know how to address it when it does happen, or like how do you approach getting removed from your chart, things like that. So it's on there for at least two years, and. Um, the other side of the slide is really just some actual real life examples of reasons people have been given behavioral flags. Um, so everything from raising our, your voice to like physical violence. Uh, yeah, so just to give you guys some examples. Uh, next, thanks Sharon. Um, so with that, I do wanna turn it over to uh, my colleague Chelsea, who's gonna look at this from the, not so much the research perspective, but more of like what, what are vets and veterans saying? Thank you. Hi, everyone. So um, as Dr. Shaw had said, we, we wanted to think also about what are people with lived experiences of these disruptive behavior flags, um, thinking about this issue. And unfortunately, there really isn't any um, qualitative or quantitative literature out there to help guide us. So we turned to what opinions are being posted and talked about publicly. So what we're going to share next are just some different views that um, have been posted publicly on social media by folks who've experienced or have concerns about disruptive behavior flag systems. Uh, so I won't read through all of these, but you see one that says, I'm being effective by the VA disruptive behavior you reported in the past, help. Uh, one that says, I think the VA disruptive behavior system has major flaws and needs to be overhauled, no accountability, no transparency, and lots of loopholes for staff to use it to retaliate. So a lot of concerns about confusion and secrecy with this. <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, uh, over here, you see one that says, under VA policy on patient record flags, federal bureaucrats uh, classify that as threats based on difficult, annoying, and non-compliant behavior. Um, you see a, a clear mistrust of the VA, um, a clear um, uh, apprehension to the system, and concern about, um, you know, things like complaints, things like trying to advocate for themselves being misconstrued um, as disruptive behavior and creating problems because of that. Right about now, the Disruptive Behavior Committee is meeting to decide how to handle me. Um, VA employees are filing disruptive behavior reports against vets who threaten suicide, file complaints, or complain about claims that are backlogged. Uh, where can I find regulations on this disruptive behavior committee? Shouldn't every hospital follow the same procedure? Um, so you just see a lot of concern from veterans in the VA healthcare system that there's no regulations, it's not transparent, um, as well as that uh, they don't feel their confidentiality is being maintained, that um, things are getting uh, given to law enforcement. Um, and that they can't uh, advocate for themselves about issues within the healthcare system um, or even uh, potentially disclosing suicidal ideation. Uh, so, so just to, to summarize, while there are certainly benefits and providers uh, like a lot about the flag system and it is one of the ways to help providers uh, have, have protection when working with potentially violent populations, um, on the other hand, those with lived experiences are really reporting, finding them not helpful. Um, and at the very least that they're confusing and, and clearly quite stigmatizing, um, which I think for our folk with BPD um, is particularly problematic because this is a population who is struggling with expressing anger, regulating their emotions, managing their interpersonal communications. Um, and, you know, being within this especially invalidating system with this, these disruptive behavior pla flags becomes pretty problematic. So what we propose is uh, a way that DBT skills can be valuable to managing this system. And what we'll be spending the rest of the workshop uh, in our time today on is how providers can be better equipped to address behaviors before they get to the point of needing a flag as well as we'll talk about how to use skills so that flags could potentially be more therapeutically implicated um, and utilized uh, for accountability, support, 
and reinforcing skill use rather than um, a confusing and, and punitive system. So I will turn it over to my colleague, Rebecca Lusk, uh, for this next portion. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we've recorded a series of fictional role plays based on real experiences that we've encountered within our VA healthcare system to illustrate the pathway that commonly happens from problem behavior to behavior flag in a DBT patient population. In the first video that's coming up, you'll see a DBT client and her DBT psychiatrist en engaged in a, a fictional psychiatry appointment. While you're viewing this recording, we invite you to write in the comment box um, what you are seeing as it pertains to the use of DBT skills or the lack of use of DBT skills on in both, both parties here. Um, consider your consider uh, potential skills use uh, for the therapist. Consider potential skills use for the patient. Consider things like patient interfering behavior or therapist interfering behavior um, when you're when you're writing in the chat. Uh, hey, how's it going today? Uh, hey, Dr. Deshong, it's, it's, you know, it's not very good, these meds, um, they're just not working. I think we need to change some, change some stuff up. I, I'm not even sure if I should, I'm not even really taking them at this point because it's not working out. Well, you know, you haven't been on them that long and, and it sounds like you aren't taking them. So how do we know that they're going to be helpful? Well, I know, I mean, I know my body and, uh, like, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been a few months. Uh, I mean, yeah, but you know, sometimes it does take a little while for the, the meds to really kick in and, and work with, with the person. Well, um, I mean, I think I, I just want to talk about some options. So like, if you could just listen for a minute and I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I mean, we, we can, I feel like maybe our session might be better utilized with talking about how to better manage taking these medications. Well, you're not even listening to me. What do you think you are, like this fancy doctor that knows better than everybody else? I, you're not even letting me talk. Um, do you, you even know, care about, like, how I'm doing? You, you know... Kelsey, I just, you know, like, let's, let's take it down a little bit. Like, I don't want to have to, take you know, it down get, a little bit, you know, I don't want to have to give you like a, like a behavioral warning flag or anything like that. Are you kidding me? I, I just, you are lucky this is a video appointment. I would smack that smirk off your face so fast. It, it, Chelsea, like, I, I feel like. You know, things are getting a little bit out of hand. Like, I just... You, you haven't know. even let me tell you why I want to change the medications. You know, this I... Is why veterans are killing themselves outside of the VAs. It's shit like this. Yeah, I think, you know, it's probably best if we just kind of end things here. It feels like you're really... Yeah, we're like definitely going to end things right here. Now. I want a new doctor. All right, well, I will, I will be in touch. Rebecca, did you want me to go to the next video? Okay, in the second video that's gonna be coming up next, you'll be seeing the DBT psychiatrist the same psychiatrist you saw in this video, consulting with the DBT therapist for this patient. And what they're gonna be talking about is consultation around the problematic interpersonal interaction that led to the behavior flag. Um, again, in the chat box, we invite you to comment on effective use of skills um, and or therapist therapy interfering behaviors. Uh, 
Um, so she just was so over the top and just so aggressive with me. I had to give her a behavioral flag. Like she was just being too much and we don't need to deal with that. So Hillary, I can sense that you are feeling a lot of emotions about um, this patient. Uh, and I'm also hearing some words and some terms that might be a little bit judgmental. So I'm wondering if maybe we can look at um, the, like, the behavior that's causing you distress. What is it that, what is the behavior that she was showing up with? I mean, she threatened me. She said she, you know, if we were in person, she would actually, like, be violent with me. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's probably a lot of reasons why perhaps she showed up with that behavior. Um, it might be helpful for us to look at the emotion behind it. Maybe we can address that emotion with her in therapy. I mean, I, I guess like she just like needs to accept that she's getting this flag and just needs to figure out a better way to talk to her care providers. So maybe together you and I can talk about um, some behaviors that we would want to see uh, from her that might be more effective and then maybe we can help coach her on that. Yeah, we can do that. All right, and we have one more video clip for you. In the third video clip, you're going to see the patient's DBT therapist along with the patient who received the behavioral flag and they are discussing the events that led up to it. Um, and then again here, we invite you to comment um, in the chat box about what DBT skills you see being used. Maybe there are some skills that you don't see being used that you as a DBT clinician would want to, to try, or maybe as a DBT, um, somebody with lived experience, you would want to receive from your therapist in this experience. Um, so if you have those thoughts, please, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. All right. Hi, Chelsea. How's it's it going good. today? It's not good. I'm yeah. sure you heard, but it's good. Why don't you talk about it? You want to call her a psychiatrist? Doctor Deshong thinks I'm a danger and put me on a behavior flag, and so now I don't trust anybody. And I just wanted to talk to her about my medications, like we had talked about. And I usually like Doctor Deshaun, but she just was not listening. She's so, like, she thinks she's better than everybody else, and I don't know what to do about it. Yeah, so, it's so, so incredibly frustrating when we feel like people are not listening to us, and we feel like we're not able to get our needs met because of that. And so, I, I'm curious, uh, did you think about using skills in that moment? You know, I did, I did try to take a breath. I did try to take a breath because as right. soon as she was like, she's like condescending and not looking at me, I felt like I was going to hulk out. I felt so small in that moment. Um, and I did try to take a breath, but then she just kept on acting like she's better than, she knows better than I do because she's a fancy doctor. And I just, I lost it and I just, told her I wanted to slap that smirk off her face, and I know that's not shit I'm supposed to say, but that's, that's what happened. Sounds like you were so, yes, really, Elizabeth, yeah. I think I needed more skills. Yeah. And so did yeah. Dr. Okay, all right. So it sounds like you were really, really frustrated in that moment, and it makes sense that your mind kind of went to doing what your emotion mind wanted to do, um, and, and yet, do you think that was effective? No. No. All right. So yeah, let's talk about some of the skills that you could use. What are some other distress tolerance skills that uh, you can think that might have been helpful in that moment? Um, I know sometimes that like the tip skills work for me, like the ice, the cold temperature. Um, uh, I don't, I mean, I would have had to like get out of my session for a minute and go get some ice, but I guess I could have done that. Um, or like having my dog with me, that, that always calms me down. What happens? So I, I guess I could have had that. Um, or I haven't used it in a while, but I know.
know when we were first working together, you had me make a little bag with like lotion and sour candies and that might, that kind of stuff maybe would have helped. I mean, I don't know. I was pretty, pretty angry, but that could have yeah. helped. Sounds like you were definitely pretty angry. And again, I totally get that. Um, and I think that you're right, that, that having perhaps a distress tolerance kit or a bag nearby would have been really helpful. So maybe that's something you and I can work on is um, kind of thinking about how to cope ahead and perhaps having something that's handy, especially if you're gonna have more video appointments uh, with that Dr. Chong or, or anybody else. Um, and what about uh, interpersonal effectiveness skills? Do you remember us talking about those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the dear man's. The dear man, yeah, yeah. How do you think? Um, how do you think that might have been helpful in that situation? Well, I think I started out pretty effective, and the doctor Deshaun needs to take a DBT class. But um, I think I needed to work on like the mindfulness part. You know, being like more in the moment and um what do you talk about like just keeping with what i need to focus on and uh you know rather than just like getting pissed off and yeah. so i think it probably would be helpful if i had had it more mapped out and could have like just stayed with my point instead of getting like so caught up in how she was treating me absolutely yeah and it is it is um, it can be really hard when we feel like other people aren't skillful and here's the thing we cannot control whether other people are skillful or not we can only control if we are skillful and that's what I really want to help you do so that you feel like you um, are, are more effective in these situations rather than uh, feeling like your anger and your emotion mind kind of takes over so what I'd like you to work on this week is maybe writing out a dear man script um, for uh, the next time you have an interaction with a psychiatrist in terms of wanting to, to, to make some changes. Um, and maybe we can review that next session. Does that sound like a, a good plan? Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. You're so welcome. Have a good, have a good day. All right, so in the previous three video clips, we observed a fictional role play between a DBT client, a DBT psychiatrist, and the DBT therapist. And unfortunately, um, this interaction resulted in an unwanted and unexpected problem behavior showing up for the patient. The consequence for the problem behavior was that the client was punished by being given a behavior flag. Um, so our, our uh, theory is that behavior flags are given because a lot of providers in the medical center are not familiar with how BPD symptoms manifest themselves during agitation. Um, they, they maybe mischaracterize it, they misunderstand it, um, they don't fully um, appreciate the uh, patient's point of view or their emotional experience. And um, what ends up happening is this group gets stigmatized, they get punished, and they be, they are labeled as disruptive. Um, the patient population who receives these flags is um, restricted from some health care. They're being given limits uh, in terms of what they can and can't do within the medical center once they receive these flags. Um, but the problem is, uh, that they're not receiving treatment intervention. They're not receiving referrals to healthcare providers who can really evaluate them, who can really maybe help them um, with advocating for themselves. They can't receive the coaching they might need to get themselves out of these situations and, and back on or get off the, the behavior flag status. Um, and so one of the things that we would like to propose as, as part of this uh, presentation today is um, helping to educate our um, behavior, our, our medical center staff on uh, interventions that might be appropriate, helping to orient them to better understand what behaviors they're seeing and how those may be addressed, um, helping them with effective application of skills. Um, and uh, just general knowledge about um, how to work with people who have agitation. 
Um, so we just would like to hear from the group at this point. If you'd like to chat in the chat box or if you would like to unmute yourselves, um, what do you think are some of the factors from the role plays that you saw, you directly observed that might have led to the outcome of the patient being punished and given this behavior flag? I think the threatening statement about, you know, if we were in person, I'd rip your face off. Um, that can be pretty triggering, especially for yeah. some of our <laughs> providers. So. Absolutely, that's sort of a scary thing to hear. <laughs> right, and as as um, as a DBT therapist, you know, one of the things that um, I've I've heard uh, Dr. Linhan and other you know well well known DBT providers say is we don't want to validate the invalid. So telling the patient that that behavior is okay, that yeah, when you're angry, you, you certainly can say these things. Um, we don't want to validate the invalid. What we want to do is, is um, maybe talk with them more about the emotions that they're experiencing and, and better ways to handle those interpersonally so that they're getting their needs met and not losing things that are important to them. How about others in the group? Um, um, I would like to say something. Yes. Please. Yes. Hi. Um, I'm a peer support specialist here at downtown LA, and I, I would say about a week ago, um, I was conducting a uh, HUD rash screening for a veteran, and prior before conducting the uh, screening, I looked over his notes, and when I opened up the uh, uh, his file, it did actually have a behavioral flag, and I was looking over what what had happened, and I took you know precaution as far as how to approach the veteran so when I spoke with the veteran over the phone and I could hear that he was a little bit upset about what the situation would have happened about him losing his home and the trigger point uh when I asked him about how did you lose your home and he mentioned about how he went to Las Vegas and blew all his savings and you know, savings account, savings, mm -hmm. actually pretty much savings in Las Vegas and came back uh, with nothing. So mm -hmm. he never went and answered that question, but he started to become uh, really frustrated. And, you know, and when he was explaining about like his experiences, you know, when he was in the military, uh, he was a Vietnam veteran, and of course, a, uh, a veteran, uh, in, well, uh, he says he's a African-American veteran, uh, you know, uh, he uh, was pretty much just like very full of rage. And I mm -hmm. um, I did my best as far as validating, validating his uh, feelings. And mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, Mr. So-and-so, I, I could definitely hear that you have a, a lot of, um, you know, trauma in your life. And, you know, that's something that's going to, you know, mm -hmm. that you really need to address. And, you know, if you allow me to help you to uh, conduct this uh, home screening, you know, screening for HUD VASH, uh, hopefully this will be one, uh, at least a step uh, mm -hmm. to his uh, recovery on, on getting, you know, uh, mental health behavior. But mm -hmm. he didn't want it to. So it was, unfortunately, it didn't go very well but i you know i, I think you know uh, what you were saying is just like validating their concerns and their feelings is, is one way to help them even though they don't want to listen but at least you're showing that you have empathy and you're understanding their situation yeah rafael i love how you um tried to listen to everything that he was saying and you sort of identified that this is a guy who's been through a lot and you pointed that out to him as though you were hearing him um i i think that is so meaningful and a great way to approach people who are having a rough go um and what we can do is be that broken record and keep offering those services and keep reminding them that help is available. And, you know, hopefully one of the, those times they'll take us up on the offer. Um, and Rebecca, if I could jump in as well, you know, I, in, in sort of hearing about this, I think as clinicians, we also have a, I mean, kind of finding that middle path, right? Because we also, not only do we validate the emotional 
place that the, the veteran is coming from, you know, if we kind of take a DBT approach, all behavior is caused, um, you know, we can sort of look at this as uh, any behavior as a way to get their needs met that they might not have other tools. Um, and yet we also have to be very mindful and very validating of clinicians, right? And that clinicians have different levels of, of risk that they are comfortable with. Clinicians have different training. Um, they, they bring their own stuff to the table as well. And I think that, um, you know, one of the things that I often think about when working with other staff is to also keep that in mind and validate staff um, and sort of treat, treating both the patient and staff as like, these are opportunities for us to learn and grow. Um, so I think that's something really important to keep in mind as well. Absolutely. That's a great point. Um, in light of time, just keeping my eye on the clock here, it looks like we have about five minutes remaining. So I just want to finish up with the final two slides that we've prepared for you, and then we can um, do more Q&A, more discussion. Um, so uh, we are proposing that the consultation team for the DBT program can be an integral part of the medical center and working with patients who have behavioral flags. That can be done in a couple of different ways, both within the consultation team itself, within that DBT team, but also with that team doing some outreach to providers in the medical center who are not familiar with DBT, do not have DBT training, um, and maybe don't understand these behaviors very well. So sort of serving as a consultant to other people outside of the DBT team. Um, I think one really important relationship that can be forged there is between the consultation team members and the um, program director for the disruptive patient program at your local facility. Um, letting that patient, letting that individual know that this program exists, that we often work with people who have high healthcare utilization and have uh, low capacity for managing agitation, um, that we would be willing to work with them to provide education, guidance, orienting, that we would be willing to accept referrals um, from various programs regarding these patients to provide evaluation and potentially treatment if they're appropriate for the program. Um, but those relationships don't seem to exist very readily right now. And at least at our level, I'm hearing from our um, disruptive patient program coordinator that, that the program itself doesn't really have any knowledge about what to do with this with this group of people and how to work with them appropriately. Um, and so in my most recent conversation, um, I was telling the program director about this presentation that we were preparing and his feedback to me was, wow, this is groundbreaking stuff and uh, we need more of this in VA and we need more of these relationships to be forged and we need more information and education about this so we can be working with these veterans um, to help them uh, improve their lives and build a life worth living. Um, so ways in which the consultation team can be helpful there are to continue to provide support and therapy for the therapists that we all remain effective. I think you saw in our video, um, our video role play that maybe there weren't some things that, that the psychiatrist on the team was doing so well. Um, maybe there is some, some therapy for the therapist that could be happening within the broader consultation team there to provide support to her around her limits in terms of working with this patient, but also to help improve her effectiveness um, and maybe providing validation or other interpersonal, meeting other personal interpersonal needs that the, the veteran had. Um, also, DBT providing providers treating clients with life-threatening behaviors um, and sort of maintaining that balance, re remembering to maintain the balance between acceptance of problem behaviors and, um, and setting limits or being too demanding, kind of remembering that we want to try and walk the middle path with um, acceptance and making demands, because if we kind of go too far in either one of those directions, we may become ineffective as DBT providers. Um, can you go to the next slide, Sharon? Thank you. Um, and then using the consultation team 
uh, format to remind ourselves of the agreements that we make as consultation team members. Um, we agree that, that there's a primary goal for the group to improve our own skills as DBT clinicians and um, not to serve as the go-between for clients to each other. So we don't want to like swoop in as a DBT therapist and try and solve that problem for the psychiatrist and the patient, but we might want to coach each of them individually in how to become more effective with one another. Um, and that's really, really important because I think a, a lot of times within the medical uh, center setting outside of the DBT team, that happens quite frequently, where uh, a primary care physician or another physician might come to us and say, well, what are you doing about my patient who's acting in this way in my clinic? And they're, they're wanting us to kind of um, be the middle person who solves that. So just kind of remembering that agreement. Um, for the therapy, for the therapist portion, we can always help each other sort of remember do you know what is needed in a situation? Do you know how to use a particular skill? Um, do you want to use that particular skill? Because sometimes we know what to do and we know how to do it, but we just don't want to do it. Why? Because as DBT therapists, we're human too. And we have other things going on that may be pre, you know, getting in the way of our motivation. Um, so really kind of at, you know, using the consultation team to teach us keep each of us accountable in these ways and in these areas um, can be very effective in working with patients who have agitation and who have these um, kinds of life-threatening behaviors. All right, um, I think it's really important that we also sort of keep perspective that as a, a team and as individual therapists working with uh, folks who have BPD, that um, sometimes we can lose our balance. And um, we, really, we really want to always remind ourselves to walk that middle path. And um, you know, having that consultation team available can help with that accountability, help with those reminders, especially when that consultation team is happening on a weekly basis as it's intended to occur. So another plug for adherence. I know this wasn't an adherence talk, but um, uh, there's some really great work coming out right now about the importance of adherence. And if we adhere to the principles as they are laid out as a consultation team, I think we can improve and we can also really help this group of patients who find themselves with um, disruptive behavioral flags. Um, so with that, I'm going to end here, but if you do have anything else, please feel free to put it in the chat and we will um, be sure to answer your question or to follow up with you in some way. And I just, uh, if you now is our break, if you need to take a break, please, by all means, you can log off. I, I do wanna answer um, Sarah's question here. Uh, what about working with patients who aren't in DBT? I think that's a great question. And uh, if you are familiar with the DBT principles, um, you can apply the principles to anybody. Uh, you can apply it to non-DBT patients, DBT patients, staff, your spouse, right? You know, we can use DBT principles with anybody. And um, and so I think the, the thing to really keep in mind is what um, Rebecca said, which is we want to validate what's valid, not validate what's invalid. So we can shape behavior um, through that. And, um, you know, and, and in terms of staff that might have some resistance, I do think it really takes a, a lot of um, kind of practice with them, a lot of being a broken record, having them see the benefit um, when they can sort of observe it in action and see how changing their approach is effective, then you're gonna get more buy-in from staff. So any other questions before we wrap up? All right, thank you all for participating today. And uh, if you are in the VA system and want to chat more with us, then look us up. We are out of Ann Arbor VA. And uh, thank you all for participating.